My name is William Cahill. I represent California State University in Fresno. Uh, my topic is the purpose and structure of education in 17th century England, a comparison of curricular theories. Uh, this project is part of my ongoing uh, Keystone class, that would, Capstone class that we have in history, History 100W, so it is a work in progress. Uh, I came to this topic because my historical specialty is early modern Europe, and I'm interested in education theory in particular. And I came to this theory topic, as Mr. Logan explained about what microhistory is, is because I had larger questions about the Enlightenment and what the Enlightenment was. And I feel that a case study in this period, you know, with one decade, the 1690s, of education theory in England, we can answer some of those questions regarding the Enlightenment. So regarding the historical context, I generally consider the Enlightenment to be from 1650 to around 1800 with the rise of Romanticism. And it's this idea that society can be reformed and improved using empirical means for reason. Uh, now this period, the 1690s, is particularly important uh, because 1688, you had the Glorious Revolution, where Catholic autocrat James II was overthrown, replaced by William and Mary. Uh, the following year, you had the English Act Bill of Rights, 1689, as well as the Act of Toleration. Now, the Act of Toleration essentially legalized, formalized that England was to be religious plural, that religious pluralism was to be tolerated in England among any of these sects that rejected transubstantiation. Now, as a result, you had Puritans, Anglicans, and Quakers and none of them could particularly dominate in English society. And this is significant with some of my secondary sources. I looked at Harvey Chiswick, who wrote The Limits of Reform in the Enlightenment, uh, Lawrence Stone, who wrote Literacy and Education in England from 1640 to 1900, and C. John Somerville, who wrote The Distinction Between Indoctrination and Education in England, 1549 to 1719. Now, most of these scholars focus on you know, particular education theorists or particular philosophers. Uh, Harvey Chiswick talks a lot about John Locke and his role during the time period. He's one who characterizes John Locke as being one of those philosophers who believes in spreading the values of the Enlightenment. And I see this as one of the major conflicts between the philosophers and the education theorists at the time regarding what was the Enlightenment and whose responsibility was it to carry on those ideals. Was it to be the aristocracy or was it to be the people? Now, Lawrence Stone, he talks about the structures that impact you know, how education was going to be formed. He talks a lot about whether it was both, uh, job opportunities, the religion, and the political institutions of the time being most important in how schools were structured. C. John Somerville focuses on Puritan education and the transition and how Puritans catechi conducted catechism for their students. Um, where I found them lacking is when I studied the primary sources, the, I was able to look at or propose to delineate them based on the role of the student that they theorized, the goal of education, and the secondary sources have a great lack of focus on the specific curriculum proposed by these educational theorists. So I've delineated like this, that the role of the student is divided as far as whether there should be sensory education or caste-based. Now, Harvey Chiswick says that sensationalist psychology is Proposition 1 of the Enlightenment. This is this idea, like John Locke's tabular rasa, the blank slate, this idea that you can take any student and they will learn what you present to them and what they experience, what they see and what they hear. This contrasts with previous generations of education theorists who say that essentially, if you were meant to learn the classics, you would have been born to an aristocrat. You also see a transition between, from memorization to conceptual education. Now the Puritans are moving away from just having their students memorize biblical scriptures and actually understand the underlying theology behind it. Also, particularly with John Locke, he advocates freedom for the student, that they must be allowed to experience freedom in order to obtain dominion and property over their education. For the purpose of education, you have this are you enlightening citizens or are you teaching subjects? Now, Chiswick again, he characterizes certain philosophers during the Enlightenment as wanting to spread these ideals, spread it as broadly as possible. However, you had other philosophers who saw social utility in keeping large proportions of the population in ignorance and illusion as a means for social control. And this is reflected in how some of these particular courses are proposed by these education theorists. Uh, is there going to be a classical education or is it going to be vocational? Who are you training with this kind of education? 
Are you training people in order to work, or are you training people in order to, to know just a, a wide survey knowledge of every course? And liberation versus social control. You will see that some courses are proposed in order to try to achieve a certain end, in order to get people to either be more law-abiding or to be more compliant. Now, the specific curriculum in particular I focus on, the role of Latin in the classics, particularly Latin, Hebrew, Greek, what was the point of learning these subjects? What was it to achieve? History and the sciences. What kind of context were they to be presented in? And the progression of courses and how particular courses corresponded with each other. Now, the three particular theorists that I decided to focus on was Mark Lewis, John Locke, and Robert Ainsworth. This list is in chronological order of their writings. I originally looked at nine theorists. However, I pared it down to these three because I believe that they most clearly elucidate the, the the rationale behind their particular educational proposals. Uh, Mark Lewis writing a model for a school for the better education of youth. He is writing specifically for the children of gentlemen. John Locke, some thoughts concerning education, and Robert Ainsworth, the most natural and easy way of institution. Both of them are writing for the general public. I want to start with John Locke, even though Mark Lewis was first, because he's generally the most well-known of the three. Now, John Locke, as I said, the tabula rasa, this idea of sensational psychology, this sensory learning, this idea that there are no innate ideas that people are born with, but that they can be trained from the ground up. Now, he proposed uh, Latin in the classics as a means for international communication. Uh, if you wanted to learn Greek and Hebrew, you can learn those if you wanted to be a scholar. However, it was not necessary in order to function in the real world as a businessman. Now, he proposed First, to learn geography, that you know the physical features of the earth, you know the bays and the rivers by the time that you're six, and that this will set the foundation for you to obtain future knowledge when your judgment is ripe enough for it. And then arithmetic, which is the easiest, and he says consequently the first type of abstract reasoning that a student should learn. And once you know arithmetic, you can return to geography, and now you will be able to learn about the poles and the meridians, you know, and these more abstract ideas concerning the globe. And then astronomy, learning the Copernican system, you know, learning about our own solar system, and, um, and then chronology. Now, chronology is the study of these epochs of history and placing yourself in context. So you learn about the classical period, they didn't call it, but the dark ages. You know, this idea that you are part of this grouping of history and that you can place yourself within this context and that it was necessary to know geography and chronology in order to learn history. That if you did not have chronology and geography, history would just be a jumbled mess of facts that made no sense. However, with it, then history would be the great mistress of prudence and civil knowledge. He then argues to move forward with ethics, learning uh, Tully's offices. Now, Locke says that if you want to learn morality, read the Bible. If you want to know ethics, read the classics. So this is one of his functions for learning the classics. Now he shies away from talking about learning about these Greek and Hebrew in order to read primary sources of the Bible, and that's part of this Protestant ideal at the time, that the Bible and all these scriptures are printed in the vernacular, and it is not necessary in order to study these classical languages unless you're going to be a scholar. Then he moves on to civil law in Latin, and that if you know civil law and Latin, then you can be turned loose into the world, and that you will find great success and esteem everywhere. So essentially, so that you are able to be better trained in order to have a, a quality position in business, particularly in the international market. Then law, that he says that students need to learn the law, the reasons, the rationale behind why English law is the way it is, why these statutes are placed over the citizenry, and that if they understand the rationale, then they will be more likely to obey its precepts. So this is Locke's take on this idea of social control, that ignorance is not necessary, that you can enlighten citizens, and through that, you can get them to follow the law. Uh, he really discounts logic and rhetoric, saying that it is not necessary for a young person to be able to speak eloquently as much as it is necessary for them to actually know the material. And in his most ambitious proposal, he says that geography, chronology, arithmetic, all these subjects, that if you teach students those subjects in Latin and French, not only will they know Latin and French, but all those subjects as well. 
Following this, I go to Mark Lewis. Mark Lewis, not a great deal is known about him. He actually wrote under a pseudonym, A.B., uh, and he was writing to a member of parliament with, with this letter, and like I said, it actually predates Locke, and it is intended for children of gentlemen. Now, he starts with needing to learn the toy form, reading, writing, grammar, this copia verborum, this memorizing, this vast vocabulary, and that this will lay the foundation for students to learn other materials, and that memorization is necessary in order to move forward. He moves on to the pleasant part of education, as he says, solid, the herbs, anatomy, astronomy, arithmetic, and geography, and then the mechanical and complemental, this idea of dancing, singing, and fencing, you know, all these aristocratic skills, all these things that you, you can picture the upper class engaging in for leisure, for pleasure, and that do not necessarily have great applicability for trying to find a job, you know, in other, other countries. I uh, said that grammar needs to be made short and plain, and that the way to gain the copy verborum is to be made easy. And that's something I've seen through all three of these theorists, that they want to make education as pleasant, as pleasurable, as sweet to the senses as possible. The utilization of lovely maps in order to learn geography. Now, the progression of courses, he says you can learn arithmetic at the very same time as spelling, because nine numbers are not as hard to learn as all the letters are. Then you learn to write, and then geometry, so that a student, it will be natural to them that they will handle a compass just as well as they can handle a pen. Then astronomy and geography, using globes and maps, these visual tools, so that it will become a pleasure to the students to learn about them. More natural science with herbs, birds, plants, trees, to understand the world around them, and anatomy. That is in order to lay a foundation for future knowledge. Gardening and planting, and then traveling within their country, and then abroad in order to gain experiences. And then dancing, singing, music, and theater. Third theorist is Robert Ainsworth. I apologize for the anachronism. Uh, but he was a Latin lexicographer. He wrote Latin dictionaries. Uh, and like I said, this, this, this is intended for the broad citizenry. Now, with his role as a Latin lexicographer, it's not surprising that he did want to make Latin a living language, one that continuously was spoken, not reserved for only scholars, and not reserved solely for use in international communication. Now, he read Locke. He specifically references Locke in his writing. He, he specifically referenced Locke when he talks about Locke's idea to teach kid, children how to read at a young age, and that you could place letters on dice and that when a children rolls the dice, then they could spell out a word. Uh, he also, his, his, the title of his paper, you know, the most natural and easy way of education is specifically from Locke. Locke's argument, education has to be enjoyable, pleasurable, so that way students will hang on the lips of their masters. Uh, for Ainsworth, he wants students to have a taste of all arts and sciences. This broad survey knowledge of all these subjects because it is more important 